All right, let's go over Catalan. Um, so this Catalan chapter, Catalan 1, A Game of Thrones, is, it's short. It's the third shortest chapter um, in the entire series. Uh, it's only a little over 2,000 words. There's one, there's another, I think there's a John chapter that's a little little less and a Bran chapter that's like 1,700 words. Chapters this short do not, like even close to this short, do not appear like once we get beyond um, A Clash of Kings. Like George just regularly makes things 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 words. So it's a little interesting. Now, Catalan, the writing style for Catalan is George R. R. Martin on in his almost i would say his regular writing mode um she and Tyrion are are where he's throwing in the most poetic uh language he'll make long sentences you know Catalan's obviously not as funny as Tyrion um or edgy as Tyrion but this is where he's he's trying to make an environment as beautiful as possible and he's going to use the his vocabulary that he has to do it um, there's no active process of making someone simple, shortening the sentences, pretending to be a child, pretending to be insane or anything like that. Um, even, even cat, even Tyrion, you know, is, he's trying to make it witty and he's, and so in a sense, Catalan is the most, uh, George of any writing on, on a kind of very basic level. Like if he were just to write and not have to think about the voice he would default to Catalan. Um, now, the way the way the first four chapters are structured is you have a prologue. I mean, the first four chapters are almost all just establishing setting. But the first one was North of the Wall with 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 Will. Then we have the North with Bran. And even though this is this is still in the North, it's Catalan, and you're really getting an idea of the rest of the Seven Kingdoms with Catalan because of her perspective, her being a riverlander. And then the fourth chapter is Daenerys, so we go to Essos. And so you kind of have, at least in the Game of Thrones structure, that this was going to be kind of the four worlds, north of the wall, the north, the south, and the uh, and Essos. We kind of know that it, it changes, you know, obviously the south becomes bigger and we, we start learning all the little places of the south. Um, and even though a lot of stuff happens in the north, we don't actually explore the north that much. Most stuff just kind of focuses in one, around Winterfell. We get a little bit of, you know, beyond the wall, the wall and beyond um, with John and, and Bran's journeys. But um, you can kind of see like how, how George had set everything up uh, in the beginning. It was quite logical. I'm going to have a north of the wall chapter dealing with the Night's Watch. I'm going to have a north chapter centered around Winterfell. I'm going to have something that brings in the King's Landing plot, the South, and then I'm going to have something that deals with Essos and, and Daenerys. And, but, you know, the, the story changes over time. Um, so Catalan. Catalan had never liked this God's Wood. Um, and again, this is just setting. Now we have to figure out what is a God's Wood? What is she talking about? Um, she had been born in Tully, a river run far to the, at River Run far to the South. On the red fork of the trident, the god's wood, there was a garden, bright and airy, where tall redwoods spread dappling, uh, dappled shadows across tinkling streams. Birds sang from hidden nests, and the air was spicy with the scent of flowers. Again, just completely different writing style from, from Will and Bran. We, we, we are just in poetry mode. <clears throat> the gods of Winterfell kept different, uh, a different sort of wood. It was a dark, primal place, three acres of old forest untouched for 10,000 years as the gloomy castle rose around it. It smelled of moist earth and decay. No redwoods grew here. This was a wood of stubborn sentinel trees, armored in gray-green needles, of mighty oaks, of ironwoods, ironwoods as old as the realm itself. Here the thick black trunks crowned close together while twisted branches wove a dense canopy overhead and misshapen roots wrestled beneath the soil. This was a place of deep silence and brooding, shadows, and the gods who lived here had no names. Um, all just, you know, atmosphere, cattle in perspective, George R. R. Martin in full, in full mode. Um, 
It's interesting that they just, he describes the the godswood as three acres. That's three acres is pretty big. Um, <laughs> three acres of old, of untouched old forest. Uh, uh, I suppose. Uh, I, I guess I guess that could be could be accurate. I'm just thinking how quickly you know Theon gets into the godswood and out. Um, but I guess three acres is is okay. Um. But she knew she would find her husband here tonight. Whenever he took a man's life afterward, he would seek the quiet of the godswood. And so now we're, we're kind of establishing that, that Ned, at least from Catalan's perspective, is this, is this deeply spiritual man. When we're in Ned's head, we don't get that. But <laughs> at least from Catalan's perspective, he is a spiritual man. Um, and, you know, we're establishing this, this con these, these conflicts, the, the north of the wall, south of the wall, north versus rest of king, the rest of the seven kingdoms, um, Westeros versus Essos, kind of kind of idea. Um, Catalan had been anointed with the seven oils and named in the rainbow of light that filled the Sceptre River Run. She was of the faith, like her father and grandfather, and fought his father before him. Her gods had names, and their faces were as familiar as the faces of her parents. So we're establishing that Catalan is a religious person. And yes, Catalan is absolutely a religious person. She's probably, um, with regards to the Faith of the Seven, the most religious character we have. We do hear about Davos and Brienne being religious, but um, no, one, no one approaches Catalan. Now, obviously, the Faith of the Seven, we hear about the Seven Oils. Um, the Faith of the Seven is is clearly based on Catholicism. George R. R. Martin was raised a Catholic. So rather than everything being a Trinity, everything is in sevens. Um, worship was, a, was um, worship was a septon with a censer, the smell of incense, a seven sided crystal alive with light voices raised in song. Tully's kept the co God's wood and the, as the, as all the great houses did, but it was only a place to walk or read or lie in the sun. Worship was for the sept. Um, the, uh, I mean, the, we get a little bit of a retcon with River Run. There is, uh, there is actually a, a heart tree and a werewood there and things like this. So her, like seeing this other werewood, other, uh, um, different godswood is, is, is different. Um, the, uh. But also this, this entire thing is also a, uh, it's a historical con conflict of kind of Druidic uh, religions that you might find uh, among the Celts, uh, the Celtic tribes in, in, uh, in the British Isles um, and kind of the versus the more established church of, of the Catholics, you know, like, um, and that's kind of that's kind of the, the basic you know conflict here that where is religion does is religion centered around the church or is religion centered around something a little uh less less physical you know more nature focused um some would say that this basic conflict of of kind of um druidic pagan worshipers versus the established church of of rome eventually led to say the, the the catholic protestant split that there was just a, a, a um just a a fundamental difference of course it's not a perfect analogy obviously like ireland itself was very druidic and is very catholic today but um there is just this the southern europe northern europe kind of kind of a, a dichotomy of of religion um and that that has been put here with the um, putting the old gods versus the new gods. Um, for her sake, Ned had built a small sept where she was to sing with uh, to the seven faced, faces of God. But the blood of the first men still flowed in the veins of the Starks, and his, old, own, his own gods were the old ones, the nameless, faceless gods of the Greenwood that uh, they shared with the vanished children of the forest. Um... So a few things here. Uh, he throws in old ones. This is kind of a, a loose um, 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 reference to uh, Lovecraft. Um, and 
he used the term the children of the forest. The George had a series called Beauty and the Beast. And in that there was the subterranean world of outcasts that lived beneath New York City. And the people that lived kind of in it were, were the children. So um, George has always been kind of obsessed with this, uh, with the, with this idea of, of, of like these subterranean worlds and stuff like this. So, you know, you, you get elements of stuff he he's had before in here. She, she, she tries to have this weird thing of like, oh, she doesn't understand her husband. He's, he's of the old gods and all of this. It doesn't really square logically considering that Ned was raised in the veil. Um, so really he should be very familiar with the faith of the seven. She should be, you know, and, and he should meld with her pretty easily. Um, in fact, we don't really know why Ned is so religious or became so religious or, or she perceives him as religious. I mean, John perceives Ned as religious too. Arya perceives Ned, Ned as religious, but when we're in Ned's head, not so much, but they all think he's very religious. Um. But nonetheless, he's, in fact, kind of open, right? He builds her a sept, which you'd think that of all, like, thousands of years that the Starks are around up here and married to people that are Southerners, that a few of them might have brought, <laughs> might have wanted a sept, you know? Or the fact that the Manderley's around, there's no septs. It's it's a little, it's it's miraculous that Ned would be the first person to to build the sept and he's okay with at least Arya and Sansa learning about the faith of the seven and and them being indoctrinated with both religions so it's weird because because Ned is on the one hand presented as this great compromise guy who's so open-minded but Catalan sees it still as this very foreign, different thing. Oh my God, like, how do I deal with this husband and his and his funny trees, even though River Run has those same trees and he was raised in the Vale and he's letting our children and he built me a sept and, and he's letting our children study both faiths. So, you know, it, it, one could say, well, the world is complicated, but you know, this is the, this is the setting. Like this is the first chapter. We're supposed to think that, oh, there's this conflict, this conflict between the old ways and the, and the new ways, the old gods and the new gods. For the most part, not too much of that conflict has come up. Um, between I mean, the, I mean, I suppose it comes in with the, well, no, not even because the, the High Sparrow and his extremism hasn't really affected the old gods too much. And the old gods, like the burning of the trees and stuff, seems to be coming with the R'hllor. Like this conflict of of the faith of the seven and the old gods is uh, very little of it is actually presented in, a, in our story. Anyway, um, at the center of the grove, an ancient werewood brooded over a small pool where the waters uh, were black and cold. The heart tree, Ned called it. This is this is kind of a kind of a weird retcon as well. It, Ned doesn't just call it the heart tree. Like we find out that everybody calls it the heart tree. Everybody calls them heart trees, and it's it's not just Northerners. It's like at first you're like, oh, maybe it's just the Stark children. Oh no, no, they yeah they all use they all, they all use the term heart tree. But then you find out that like. No, they use it at the wall. The, the Northerners use it. And then you find out that like, Davos uses the term. Tyrion uses the term. Everybody uses the fucking term heart tree. Everybody knows what a heart tree is. Her to be like the heart tree Ned called it. Like, like she could have said the Northerners called it or something. Or people of their faith called it. But no, Ned, Ned, Ned it's Ned, Ned's term. <laughs> like she'd never heard this term before, even though everybody else in the story knows the term. There's a, there's I mean, this is a beautiful chapter, but there's so many retcons from this chapter that happen that, that George changed. Um, the werewood's bark was white as bone, its leaves dark red, like a thousand blood-stained hands. A face had been carved in the trunk of the giant tree, its features long and melancholy. The deep cut uh, eyes red with dried sap and, and strangely watchful. They were old those eyes older than Winterfell itself. They had been, they'd seen the Brandon, the, they'd seen Brandon the builder set the first stone. If the tales were true, 
They had watched the castle's granite walls rise around them. It was said that the children of the forest had carved the faces in the trees during the dawn, uh, during the dawn centuries before the coming of the first men across the narrow sea. In the south, the last werewoods had been cut down or burned out a thousand years ago, except on the Isle of Faces, where the green men lived uh, their silent watch. Um, completely right, Kellant. <laughs> okay, completely, completely. Up here, it was different. Here, every castle had a godswood. Every godswood had a heart tree, and every heart tree, its face. Um, completely right, Kellant. River Run has a werewood with a face. Not to mention Raven Tree Hall, Storm's End, you know, out in the woods randomly. Um, they're, they're all over. They're all over. Um, the, even the veil has one cut down <laughs> that, that, that's on a throne. It, uh, so, you know, uh, obviously it's, you know, we're, we're being introduced to this. So like Catalan is the character to do it, but it's, this has all been changed. Catalan found her husband beneath the werewood. Seated on a moss-covered stone, the great sword ice was across his lap, and he was cleaning the blade in the water as black as night. A thousand years of hummus, humus, not hummus, lay thick on, upon the godswood floor, swallowing the sounds of her feet. But the red eyes of the werewood seemed to follow her as she came. Ned, she said, she said, she called softly. He lifted his head and looked to her. Catalan, he said. His voice was distant and formal. Where are the children? He would always ask her that. In the kitchen, arguing about the uh, about names for the wolf pups, she spread a cloak on the forest floor and sat beside the pool, her back to the werewood. She could feel the eyes watching her, but she didn't. She did her best to ignore them. Um. So this idea of of the faces watching, um. This comes from a lot of different George R. R. Martin stories. Um, the, the, the werewoods are, of course, a, well, I wouldn't say of course, but the werewoods are a, me a metaphor for heaven. They are, when you die, your soul goes into the werewoods. So it is, it is the manifestation of like gods, God, like heaven, gods watching you in this like hive minded thing. Um, George R. R. Martin's making a statement like, even when you look at Christianity, we all die and we join with God and we're there with everybody else in the afterlife forever. Um, and and he's, what he's saying is that's kind of like one big hive minded net, you know, and that's eternal. And so he's creating a high, an eternal hive minded net on earth with the, with the werewoods. That's what it is. Um, and he has many, many stories that contain these, these, these ideas like a song for Leah um, and seven times never kill man. Uh, and the faces aspect is, is very sand Kings, you know, um, the, you know, the, these faces, uh, the faces of God. Um, anyway, Arya is in love and Sansa is, is charmed and gracious, but Rickon is not quite sure. Is he afraid? Ned asked a little, she admitted, he is only three. They've given, they've given their three-year-old child a dire wolf pup. <laughs> and in the previous chapter, they've already established that these, these things can rip out people's arms and kill them. Is he afraid, Ned asked. A little. He is only three. Ned frowned. He must learn to face, he must learn to face his fears. You will not be three forever, and winter is coming. <laughs> He's three. <laughs> this is one of these things where people kind of joke that George isn't great with ages. You know, the children are way too old and mature for what they do. I understand he's making a, a statement about history. We often hear about these kings that are 12 years old leading people into battle and stuff like that. Um, you know, if those his if the histories and re re you know records of people's ages can be trusted, um, but yeah, three, <laughs> you know, like he can't wipe his own butt, you know, but he's uh, <laughs> you know, he he's not potty trained, but he can he can uh, he can deal with a dire wolf. 
Um, and winter is coming. Winter is coming is uh, something that comes from a story called "Then Seven Times Never Kill Man." Uh, it is it is uh, spoken by a character saying that maybe we should not be focusing on religion so much, but we should be focusing on survival and um, the practical things of life, not war, not prophecy, not crazy stuff. We need to pull in the harvest and prepare. Um, I'm not sure if it takes on the same meaning in Ice and Fire. Um, certainly the show has kind of had this like, yeah, winter is coming, badass kind of stuff. Like, oh yeah, we're bringing the war, winter is coming or something like that. Pain is coming, but that's not what it meant in N7 Times Never Kill Man. It meant, let's cut this out. Let's cut the war. Let's cut the the, the, cra the crazy um, uh, <laughs> religious talk and let's do some practical stuff about surviving. But... Um, yes, Catalan agreed. The words gave her a chill, as they always did. The stark words. Every noble house had its words. Family mottos, touchstones, prayers of sorts. They boasted of honor and glory, promised loyalty and truth, swore faith and courage. All but the Starks. Winter is coming, said the stark words. Um, not for the first time, she reflected, on what a strange people these northerners were. I mean, now that we know a lot more uh, of people's house words, they they aren't all like this. They aren't all boasting of honor and glory, glory honor and glory, loyalty and truth, faith and courage. Like some of them are pretty crazy, um, like House Cod, you know, <laughs> like which I think all all despise us and stuff like that. So like, um, you know, so it's not not necessarily true. All but the Starks, winter is coming. Um, not for the first time, okay. What a strange people these northerners were. The man died well, I'll give him that, Ned said. He had switched of, of oiled leather to one hand. He ran it lightly up the, uh, the great sword as he spoke, polishing um, the metal to a dark glow. I was glad for Bran's sake. Uh, you would have been proud of Bran. So this is this is kind of interesting because because this is the whole in the previous chapter, Ned has this unique, or at least for us with the North, um, this unique idea that the person that passes the sentence should should <clears throat> should swing the sword, and the reason for that is because a man has to be strong enough to hear the man's last words, and he's he is taking these last words to heart and he's thinking of the thinking them over and he's he's brooding and he's dwelling on them um he still unjustly killed the guy <laughs> he shouldn't have done that it was really stupid but um i do think I, I suppose the author is saying like oh if we all did that if we all really listened to people right before they died we'd, we'd learn something um ned's i guess ned like taking it in though he doesn't it doesn't have, it actually go anywhere. Like he talks about it, but that's a little bit here, but that's about it. You know, no action is really taken. Um, I've always been proud of Bran Kendall and pride watching the sword as he stroked it. Um, she could see the, the rip, uh, the rippling deep within the steel where the metal had been folded back on itself a hundred times in forging. Catalan had no love for swords, but she could not, could not deny that ice, had its own beauty. It was forged in Valyria before the doom had come uh, to the freehold uh, when the ironsmiths had worked their metal with spells as well as hammers. 400 years old it was and as sharp as the day it was forged. The name it bore still a legacy from the age of heroes when the Starks were kings in the north. Um... So yeah, this is this is this is interesting. I've never really thought about this actually. I'm glad I'm glad this has come up. Ice is actually a fairly young, a fairly young sword. It was born. It was only forged just before the doom. And the name 
is from previous swords. That other guys had swords called ice. Um, but they didn't have it until, you know, they, they didn't, the one, the ice we know is a relatively long, young sword that simply just took the name of the other swords that the, that the kings in the north had. Um, interesting that, that the sword came out just before the doom, you know, it couldn't have been like, oh, 500 years old, 600 years old. No, just then, um, right before the doom, um, You know, I guess, and maybe there's an explanation. I mean, maybe you could come up with some headcanon on why the swords are all 400 years old. Like maybe they 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 were forged a bunch, and some Valyrians they needed some money, sold some swords, like after the after the doom or something. I don't know. But here we're you know we're getting a little background more on the on the Damascus steel uh, situation here, and getting more on 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 Valyria. <clears throat> He was the fourth this year, Ned said grimly. The poor man was half mad. Something had put fear in him so deeply that my words could not reach him. He sighed. Ben writes that the strength of the Night's Watch is down below a thousand. It's not only desertions. They are losing men on rangings as well. Is it the wildlings, she asked. Who else? Of course, we know that it's someone else. Ned lifted ice, looked down the cool steel length of it, and it, will gr and it will only grow worse. The day may come when, uh, when I have no choice but to call the banners and ride north to deal with the kings beyond, king the beyond the wall for good and all. Um, beyond the wall, that made Catalan shudder. So here we're, we're, we're hearing about Mance Raider again, and we do get this kind of um, odd idea that where, where, you know, Ned is part of the Seven Kingdoms, but it's very clear that he's, he's very independent himself. He's, he's delivering justice himself in a different way. Um, and now he's talking about going to war by himself as Warden of the North. And again, like, the term Warden of the North comes from this, like, uh, concept of the of the warden the wardens of the marches um in in england the marches being the border between england and scotland um and it is true that during that period of history the marchers did have a lot of autonomy and and had their own laws even that were separate from the rest of the kingdom and were able to to do military actions independently um from from the actual kings, like, and I'm talking about both sides: the the Scottish king and the Scottish marches, and the and the English king and the English marches, um, on both sides of the border. So, um, it's it's a fascinating concept here that Ned could go to war by himself with just the North, and not even like, what's the point of the kingdom? <laughs> but, um. <clears throat> But yeah, that. But the, I think this is where 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 they're coming from, where they're talking about this, um, uh, like separation uh, and independence that they have. That I think we're we're in in the the, the kind of marcher idea. Um, beyond the wall, uh, that made Catalan shudder. Ned saw the dread in her face. Mance Raider has nothing for us to fear. Well, that's also ridiculous because we know what Mance Raider is doing. He's gotten this enormous, enormous army. Um, there are darker things beyond the wall. She glanced behind her at the heart tree, the pale bark and red eyes watching, listening, thinking it's long, slow thoughts. Um, and that's kind of interesting. His smile is gentle. You listen to too many of old man's stories. I guess, you know, they all sit around the hearth. Cat hears the stories as well. Um, but it's funny, like, why isn't Ned? Because Ned is also telling these stories about the children of the forest and stuff. So, um, but nonetheless. The others are as dead as the children of the forest. Gone 8,000 years. Maester Lewin will tell you they never lived at all. No living man has ever seen one. Now we kind of have a, a swap. Because as I was saying, it doesn't really make sense. When we're in Ned's head, 
Um, he's not very religious. He was raised in the Vale. He builds a sept for Catelyn. He raises his kids in, in dual faith. And yet everyone perceives him as this like deep, deep, deeply religious man, like bound in the old ways. And that's what Catelyn's thinking as she approaches, as she goes into this, into the scene. But then when Ned himself talks, he's the one listening to the maester. He's the one rejecting old man's stories. He's the one that's saying the others are dead. It, it's very funny. It's very funny that the disconnect between who Ned is and who people perceive Ned is, you know, I, you know, I hope it's intentional. I do think it's very fascinating that, you know, that the evidence shows that Ned is quite progressive, but everybody thinks he's not progressive. They think everybody thinks he's so religious, but he's not very religious, you know? Um, No living man has ever seen one. Ah, and here we, this is, but we actually need this like superstition aspect to be in Catalan because Catalan is the one that, that um, uh, reacts to the, the direwolf. Um, until this morning, no man had seen a direwolf either. Catalan reminded him. I, don't, I ought to know better to, than to argue with a Tully, he said with a rueful smile. He slid ice back into its sheath. You did not come here to tell me crib tales. I know how little you like this place. What is it, my lady? Catalan took her husband's hand. Uh, there was grievous news today, my lord. I do not wish to trouble you until you had cleaned, uh, cleansed yourself. There was no way to soften the blow, so she told him straight. I'm so sorry, my love. John Aaron is dead. Now, we as we as readers at this point in the story have no idea who John Aaron is, so um, this is all this is all like what's what's going on? His eyes found hers, and he could see how hard it took him. As she had known it would. In his youth, Ned had been fostered at the Erie and the childless Lord Aaron, Lord Aaron had become a second father to him and his fellow ward, Robert Baratheon. When the Mad King, King Aerys, had demanded their heads, the Lord of the Eyrie had raised his moon and falcon banners in revolt rather than to give up those he had pledged to protect. Now, this is, this is, this is, you know, now we're getting introduced very much to the idea of warding. And we find out that Ned, even though we've just been introduced for a <laughs> a few pages about how Ned, Ned is this northerner in this northern way. We find out, no, he was actually raised in the Vale. <laughs> and, you know, Robert, Ar uh, John Aaron was a second father and Robert Baratheon was a second, was a brother. And this, the warding aspect creates family, which of course makes, if you go back and you start thinking of Theon, what that could mean, you know, um, and that they were in this war together and they'd reject, they'd, they'd overthrown these, these Targaryens. Um, this is, I mean, we've, we've heard a bit about these Valyrians, but this might be, this is the first time we've hear, we're hearing of the Targaryens. And one day, I mean, unless you count Maester Aemon, uh, and one day, 15 years ago, this, this second father had become a brother as well. Here it is. And he and Ned stood together in a separate river run to wed two sisters, the daughters of Lord Hoster Tully. And so now you kind of see that, oh, this is one big family, one big family alliance. Um, John, he said, is the news certain? And at this point, you know, we know that John Snow exists and now we're hearing about John Aaron. And so the assumption here is that John, John Snow is named for John Aaron. And that, you know, Rob is named for Robert. It was the king's seal and the letter in, in, uh, in Robert's own hand. Here we go. This comes back a lot. The veracity of seals. A lot of time, a lot of time is dedicated to the veracity of seals and whether or not letters are real or fake. And <clears throat> what's interesting is there's, I don't think there has been a proven false letter obviously all the fans talk about these false letters all the time uh the pink letter for example or the the letter that that is is picked at by um when aria is heading up with the with the recruits for the nice watch by by yorin you know he picks out a letter and 
you know, is dubious of the, of the, of the seal's veracity. Um, and so here she says like, oh, she, she says, oh, no, it was the king's seal. Is the news certain? Ned from the beginning is like, this might be fake, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, so it, it's something to really, I mean, if, with regards to all the way to the pink letter, there needs to be some fake letters out there. There's been, it's such a Chekhov's gun for the entire series, how much people go into wax and, 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 and seals and everything for, for not, for there not to be a single fake letter. There has to be a fake letter in the story, <laughs> you know? So, <clears throat> but it's interesting. Ned, Ned's first thing is, is the news certain? I oh, don't know. It was certain. It was, it was the King's seal. And the letter was in Robert's own hand. I saved it for you. He said Lord Aaron had taken quickly. Even Maester Picelle was helpless. He brought, um, but he brought the milk of the poppy. So John did not linger long in pain. Milk of the poppy, of course, being being opium. <clears throat> that is some small mercy, I suppose. Mercy. This uh, coming back again, coming back again. Like this concept of mercy. We've now. Um, talking about like the mercy of the execution. Well, first off, I guess it could, could even go further that the others might have mercy killed and, and put way more out of his misery when they all came in and started slashing him. Um, <clears throat> mercy killing execution, making sure that the, the stroke is, is true. Talking about mercy killing those, those direwolf pups. And so John Aaron not dying in pain is a mercy, you know. She could see the grief on his face. Um, but of course, like all of these killings are, are unjust. It's funny that everybody's like, no, 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 no. Death, death is okay. It's a mercy, you know, but none of these situations is it really a mercy. This is murder. <clears throat> and she could see the grief on his face, but then he thought first of her, your sister and John's boy, what word of them? That's pretty, you know, that's pretty, pretty nice that Ned proves that he's actually a pretty nice guy here. He's, he, he, he has his own grief, but the first thing he thinks of is Lysa Tully and Robert Aaron. Like that's the first thing he thinks of, which is pretty, you know, pretty, pretty nice thing. You know, Ned, Ned is, Ned is a good person. Um, the message said only that they were well. And had returned to the Erie, Catalan said. I wish they had gone to River Run instead. Erie is high and lonely, and it was ever her husband's uh, and it was ever her husband's place, not hers. So now she's thinking and caring about her sister. Lord John's memory will haunt each stone. I know my sister. She needs the comfort of family and friends around her. Some more more establishment. Your uncle waits in the Vale, does he not? This is Blackfish. John named him Knight of the Gate, I'd heard. Catalan nodded. Brendan will do what he can for her and for the boy. That is some comfort, but still. Go to her, Ned urged. Take the children. Fill her halls with noise and shouts and laughter. That boy of hers needs children about him, and Lysa should not be alone in her grief. <clears throat> this is very interesting that, that <clears throat> Robert Aaron, Sweet Robin, is introduced so soon in the story. Um, and I mean, it's necessary because he is the reason that John Aaron is dead. Um, and we're, we're given the motivation for, for Lysa's murder right up front. It's, it's very well planned. Unlike say Bran and his dagger or something like that. And the, the murder of John Aaron and how it plays out from a game of Thrones to a, a storm of swords is very well planned and it makes complete sense all the way from the beginning. It's staring in everybody's face. And, um, and so when it's finally revealed, it's very fitting. Like, oh yes, that does make sense. They were trying to take Sweet Robin away and, and, and have him warded. Um, <clears throat> Would that I could, Catalan, uh, Catalan said. The letter had other tidings. The king has ridden to Winterfell to seek you out. It took Ned a moment to comprehend her words. But when the understanding came, the darkness left his eyes. Robert is coming here? 
When she nodded, a smile broke across his face. Catelyn wished she could share his joy, that she had heard the talk in the yards, a dire wolf dead in the snow, a broken antler in his throat. Dread coiled within her like a snake, but she forced herself to smile at the man she loved, this man who put no faith in signs. <clears throat> that is, this is the funny, this is uh, the interesting thing. And this does make me think it's all intentional about the, uh, like what, what, um, about the disparity between who Ned is and who people think Ned is. Um, in the previous chapter, Jon Snow comes up with this excuse that they, well, and why they should take the dire wolf soon. And it's, oh, it's a sign. Ned Stark takes no faith in signs. He has no faith in signs. That, that wouldn't have convinced him. Now we get to reinterpret that entire chapter. Ned let them keep the direwolves because Rob and Bran liked them. That was the reason. He didn't take them in because there were five direwolves and any of that. He might have been embarrassed, I suppose, like because all the other men were around him and they're like, oh, we got to kill these direwolves. But John definitely didn't convince Ned <laughs> to, take, to take in the direwolves. Ned puts no faith in signs. Because as it turns out, Ned's not that religious. <laughs> like, he, he was raised in the veil. Um, Kat is the religious one. And so when she sees Ned, she assumes he's as religious as she is. But he's not. So it, it's very, it, this is, um, it's very fun that so quickly, so quickly, we've learned that Ned is this, is this complicated character. And I, and I do think it's intentional now, you know, um, that this is not, she goes in and thinks, oh, this deeply religious, religious place. And he's in with the old ways. No, he's not. He was raised in the veil. He, he, he has, he puts no faith in signs, <clears throat> but it's Catelyn who, um, who is worried about this dire wolf and what it means. And it's Kat's choices that we need to pay attention to, not Ned's. Um, because Ned doesn't care. <laughs> <clears throat> I knew that would please you, she said. We would send word to your brother on the wall. Yes, of course. Ben will want to be here. I shall tell Maester Lewin to send his swiftest, swiftest bird. Uh, swiftest bird. I mean, you know, I don't know why. Ben, I mean, I don't know why Benjamin would want to be there, but I guess it's a party. We we never get the impression that like Benjamin has any relationship with Robert Baratheon or would care. Ned rose and pulled her to her feet. Damnation! How many years has it been? And she has no more notice than this. How many in this party did the message say? I think a hundred knights at least. With all their retainers and half again as many free riders, Cersei and the children travel with them. Um. And now we've, because of this, we've now passed over like the important thing: John's death, Lysa fleeing to the Vale, and what that means. This incredibly important piece of information, Ned's now forgotten, like <laughs> because he has to worry about Robert coming to town. Additionally, I mean, everything before, like he was dwelling on, on the, the Will's words and the wildlings and, and Mance Raider and maybe the others, you know, even though he doesn't believe in the others, he believes they're all dead. But now all of that is out the window because now we have to worry about Robert coming. Um, in a sense, like Robert choosing to go north, uh, you know, might have caused, might have really delayed the, uh, the the defense, you know, from the others or the wildling invasion because Ned gets distracted. Um, Robert will keep an easy pace for their sakes, he said. It's just as well. That will give us more time to prepare. Um, yeah, we get this idea of how long has it been uh, for all of these events. I mean, we know that the prologue happens and then in order for for Garrod to get south and then all the way to Winterfell would take, if he's on a horse, would take at least a month. 
And so he gets executed and we don't know how much time is in between finding the direwolves in this chapter, but, um, you know, we know that Rickon's still three, so not too much time. And then we get this letter and they're heading north and he says they're going to, they're heading north at a lazy pace. So we're talking, you know, it's going to be another, uh, more than a month probably before they even arrive. The queen's brother is also in their party, she told him. Ned grimaced at that. There's small love between him and the queen's family, Catalan knew. The Lannisters of Casterly Rock had come to late Robert had come late to Robert's cause when Cersei was all but certain when, when Victor was all but certain, and he had never forgiven them. Well, if the price of Robert's company is an infestation of Lannisters, so be it. It sounds as though Robert is bringing half his court. Where the king goes, the realm follows, she said. It'll be good to see the children. The youngest is still uh, sucking at the Lannister woman's... Uh, uh, the youngest was still sucking at the Lannister woman's teeth the last time I saw them. She must be what? Uh, he must be what, five now? Prince Tommen is, is seven. You know, and that's just kind of a joke. People always like mess up, mess up ages of kids and stuff over time. The same age as Bran. Please, Ned, guard your tongue. The Lannister woman... And, is our queen and her pride is said to grow with every passing year. Um, so <clears throat> they're saying that the last time Ned saw Robert was seven years ago. Um, and we don't, we don't really know. Let me see. Is that, is that the Greyjoy rebellion? No. Um, I mean, it would still be after. The, the Greyjoy Rebellion is in 289. The year now is 298. So that's nine years. So we're not sure what, what it was where he saw him a couple of years after that. But nonetheless, here we are. Ned squeezed her hand. Uh, there must be a feast, of course, with singers. And Robert will want, will want to hunt. I shall send Jory south with an, with an honor guard to meet them on the King's Road and escort them back. Gods, how are we going to feed them all? On his way already, you said. Damn the man. Damn his royal hide. And so we, you know, we get the sense of his, his friendship here. And we, we, we set up the, that there's going to be this big party and everything um, coming. But yeah, so there it is. Um, Catalan, again, you know beautifully written because it's a Catalan chapter um, trying to introduce this, this relationship between the North and the rest of the seven kingdoms, the, the King's landing Winterfell dichotomy. Um, a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of stuff changed, but we get, we get a lot of, you know, fascinating things on what a contradiction Ned is. And already it's quite apparent that, that how people perceive Ned versus who he is. Bran perceived Ned as this, like, you know, ruling distant man. And he's actually pretty warm. We find out that he he let him have those direwolves because he wanted to make his kids happy with dog, with puppies. Like, you know, um, people think he's religious. He's not religious. He's actually a softie. Um, so it's uh, it's fast, you know. That's kind of the interesting thing is the character of Ned has been given so much depth so fast. Again, you know, this has been hardly any words at all. Um, anyway, that's Catalan. And uh, I guess we'll we'll continue on to Danny next time. All right. Talk to you later.